is the ninth lecture. We're going to talk about astronomy today. So let's go and get started. Our goals for this session, we're talking about the Big Bang. Does it jive with the Bible? Did God use the Big Bang to make everything? We're talking about general relativity, starlight and time, which is a book written by Russell Humphreys. We're going to talk about things you won't hear on Discovery Channel. Magnetic field decline of the Earth, moon distance, that's changing slowly. We're talking about the anthropic principle. Things were designed for man to live on the Earth. So that's what we're going to talk about today. It's important to remember worldviews and to remember that your axioms and presuppositions are very important. And it's probably never more so important than in astronomy. The only evidence we have of these bodies that are thousands or billions of light years away is their light. And so a lot of assumptions have to be made about these bodies. And so there's man's theories and then there's, there's biblical truth. And we need to hold tightly to biblical truth and we need to hold loosely to man's theories. And the, the predominant secular theory that dominates astronomy is the Big Bang. Big Bang is to astronomy what evolution is to biology. And so I'm going to attack that pretty hard. Arthur Peacock said this, Theology should never marry the science of the day, because if she does, she'll be a widow tomorrow. So it's very, very true. We need to hold loosely to the scientific theories, and we're going to talk about a lot of scientific theories today as far as creationist theories and evolutionist theories, and we should only hold loosely to the creationist theories. So what is the Big Bang? Well, the Big Bang, it's a giant explosion that happened 16 to 20 billion years ago. And from this explosion of matter, we get everything we see today, stars, galaxies, planets. That's the way the the cosmic evolutionists will tell it. The Big Bang theory has come under significant criticism in the past few years. Here's an open letter to the scientific community published in New Scientist, May 22, 2004. This is an open letter for people to sign, and it's not written by the creationist community. It's written by uh, evolutionists themselves, and they're criticizing the Big Bang theory. It opens like this. It says, The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Inflation, dark matter, dark energy are the most prominent examples. Today, Today, virtually all financial and experimental resources in cosmology are devoted to Big Bang studies. And that's what they're upset about, is that the only people who get funding are people who believe in the Big Bang. And there's a lot of other theories out there, and they don't get any funding. Jay Gallagher and Jean Kuppel said this, they're professors of astronomy, the realization that we still do not know what makes up most of the universe has thrown astronomy off the track of normal science and into a crisis. They're not exaggerating here. Paul Davies says this, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle transcending physical principles. A true miracle. Okay, this is an an atheist. How is this any more scientific than in the beginning God? At least we have an initial cause. Before the Big Bang, they have nothing. Nobel physicist Leon Letterman said this, when you read or hear anything about the birth of the universe, someone is making it up. Remember the difference between historical science and observational science? Well, the Big Bang is historical science. No one can repeat it. It's not repeatable over and over again. It's something you can observe. And so it's purely in the realm of history, and your axioms and presuppositions are very, very important in historical science. I was sitting down a couple of years ago with a good friend of mine, and he's got a chemistry degree, a biology degree. He's got a seminary degree. He's got about four different degrees. And he said, well, couldn't God have used the Big Bang? Couldn't he have said, bang, there it is? And you've got to remember, it's not what God could have done, it's what did he say he did in Scripture. There's no doubt in my mind that God's a big enough God. If he wanted to use the Big Bang or evolution or any one of these things, he could have done it. But he didn't say he did that in Scripture, and so we need to hold tightly to the Word of God and biblical interpretation. There are a lot of biblical contradictions between the Big Bang and the first chapter of Genesis. And just the chronologies are very, very different. Number one, in creation, all elements were made together, whereas in the Big Bang, elements beyond hydrogen and helium formed after millions of years. Earth before the sun and stars, sun and stars before the earth, plants before the sun, sun before the plants, light before the sun, sun, earth's first light. Sun, moon, and stars formed together, sun formed from older stars. So you see a lot of different contradictions just in the chronology alone. And so this, I believe, is sufficient justification to warrant not believing in the Big Bang, this alone. Birds before land reptiles, land reptiles before birds. Sun, no sun. God, nothing. Dr. Chittick said this in his Ancient Man lecture at the Creation Science Mega Conference. He said, The American Association for the Advancement of Science in New York were very irritated with religious people because we purposefully invented the Big Bang as an alternative to creation. They were irritated because these Christians had taken the Big Bang and said, Oh yeah, that explains how God did it in the beginning. 
And they're like, no, no, no. See, we invented, we orchestrated the Big Bang to show how God isn't necessary. And so they were a little bit upset with that. I just thought that was humorous. Second Peter 3.10, do I believe in the Big Bang? Well, sort of. I, I don't believe in the Big Bang that cosmologists typically believe in. Second Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth shall be burned up. I believe in a Big Bang. It just hasn't happened yet. When God comes and heaven and earth flee from his presence, everything is going to melt away, and it's going to go out with a great noise. A lot of times people will say that because the universe is expanding, that that's a successful prediction from the Big Bang. The universe was already known to expand in 1910, and when the Big Bang was invented in 1927, it was invented to explain the expansion of the universe. So this isn't a successful prediction at all. It was something that the Big Bang was designed around. This is affirming the antecedent. Remember what I talked about? If Christmas sweaters exist, therefore they were made by little elves in the North Pole. Okay, just because Christmas sweaters exist doesn't mean that they were made by little elves in the North Pole. A lot of times the atheistic cosmologists will talk about how distant starlight got here. Because we say if the universe is young, the Earth is about 6,000 years old, how did distant starlight get here from galaxies that are billions of light years away? It should have taken billions of years for that to occur, right? And this is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. The atheist cosmologists have their own light time travel problem. usually don't hear about it on Discovery Channel. And it's called the Horizon Problem. In 1964 and 65, Penzia and Wilson discovered that the Earth was bathed in a faint microwave background radiation, CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a characteristic temperature. This discovery earned them the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1978. They learned that the general temperature of the universe is 2.725 degrees Kelvin. And it's very, very consistent over the entire universe. This was hailed as a successful prediction of the Big Bang model, but this couldn't be further than the truth. The horizon problem basically goes like this. If the Big Bang's true, then you should have the center of the universe should be pretty warm compared to the outer edge of the universe. So if you've got two points, A and B there, they're probably going to be different temperatures. That is what the Big Bang actually predicts. What we actually see is a very, very stable temperature over the entire universe. Okay, and this isn't what the Big Bang predicts. And so if you've got points A and B, the circle that's drawn around points A and B is the distance that the light could travel in 20 billion years. There hasn't been enough time for, for the light to travel to the far edges of the universe for the temperature over the universe to be constant. It's kind of funny because they complain that there hasn't been enough time for for light that's, that's in distant galaxies billions of light years away to travel to the Earth in only 6,000 years. But there really hasn't been enough time, even over 20 billion years, for the light to travel to the far reaches of the universe. This is pretty convincing evidence. It's kind of like the Hungry Man dinner. If you stick it in an old microwave, you end up with your chicken blazing hot, your mashed potatoes are cold, and your corn somewhere in between. Well, if you leave it there for about 10 minutes or so, everything will kind of stabilize at a constant temperature. Well, the universe hasn't had enough time according to the Big Bang model, to stabilize to a constant temperature. So it's, it's a major problem for them. And it's actually interesting. The Big Bang idea began with the Belgian astronomer George Edward Lemaitre. According to Isaac Asimov, Lemaitre conceived this mass to be no more than a few light years in diameter. Okay, so the Big Bang basically exploded from an area that's basically two light years in diameter. At the very least, this would be two light years, or about 12 trillion miles. By 1965, that figure was reduced to 275 million miles. And then it exploded from a 71 million mile sphere, and then it exploded from a 54,000 mile sphere, and then 1983, a trillionth the diameter of a proton. <laughs> they, they really know what's going on. Yeah, all right. And now uh, it's nothing at all. It's, it's what's called a singularity. It exploded from a space that's nothing at all. And I'm not exaggerating. How was the universe born and how will it end? This is what they teach to children. Most astronomers believe that about 18, 20 billion years ago, all the matter of the universe was con concentrated very dense, very hot region that may have been smaller than a period on this page. For some unknown reason, this region exploded. This explosion is called the Big Bang. In the realm of the universe, nothing really means nothing. That's so profound. Man, I wonder what children make of this when they read this. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. So uh, here's Discover Magazine, April uh, 2002. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory of inflation helps explain nothing. 
Scientific America said this, the observable universe could have evolved from infinitesimal region. It's then tending to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Okay, this is not science. It's not science at all. It's philosophy. They're using their axioms and presuppositions to try to justify not believing in God. Okay, I shouldn't have to say this, but nothingness cannot pack together. There would be no ignition to explode nothingness. There's no way to expand it. Uh, nothingness cannot produce heat, and it violates the first law of thermodynamics, which says matter can neither be created nor destroyed. It violates all the common sense and physical laws. How do they say the world began? Well, they're talking basically about a singularity here. And all the mass in the universe squished down to one really, really tiny point. That's what they're talking about. Obviously, we don't have a singularity today, so we can't put it in a, in a little beaker and analyze it. You know, put some acid in there and see what it does. But we do have some very dense portions of matter called black holes, and there's supposedly a black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. What do we observe from black holes? We observe that they're very, very stable. It's a very, very stable form of matter. It's so stable that even light can't exit it. So all the evidence seems to indicate that black holes and very, very dense matter doesn't explode. There are four observations about a singularity. Nothing is not nothing. You can't start out with nothing. It violates the first law of thermodynamics. So you've got to have the mass there. The laws of physics break down into singularity. Therefore, you cannot apply observational science to predict what it would do. A singularity is a thermodynamic dead end. Once matter is crushed into a singularity, it cannot return to other states. Okay. You can change water into ice, but you can't change the mass that's in a singularity into anything else. And a singularity is extremely stable. There's no indication that these things can explode. So there's nothing scientific about a singularity exploding. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington said this in Dismantling the Big Bang. He said, Sir Arthur Eddington held the view in the 1930s that the idea of a singularity was absurd, and he hoped that future discoveries would explain it away. So let's assume for a minute that a singularity can explode. What would happen then? Well, there would be no way to slow the particles down. So you'd get this expanding volume of gas that would just go out infinitely. There is no way to unite the particles. Uh, particles would remain the same speed and direction and rotation, and you'd get an expanding cloud of gas. That is all you'd get if it did happen to explode. Dr. Giant Narlikar, astrophysicist, said this, the Big Bang picture is not as soundly established, either theoretically or observationally, as it is usually claimed to be. It's absolutely true. So then, let's say that it did explode. So you've got this big expanding ball of gas. You then have to explain how you get galaxy stars, planets, and solar systems. The Big Bang model falls completely short in every single one of these. We're going to talk about solar systems first. And basically the nebula hypothesis is what's used to explain how solar system form. There's basically this big ball of gas that under a gravitational contraction condenses and starts spinning around and it's spun faster and faster and a star, our sun, is born, supposedly. We've got something called the conservation of angular momentum. If you have a ball of gas that's contracting and it's got some rotational speed to it, all of the bodies that form within that, whether they're planets or the sun, have the same direction of rotation to them. And you're also going to have the same momentum in the, the resultant bodies after they've condensed versus when it was still a gas form. We notice that things don't have the same rotation to them. Venus and Uranus rotate backwards from the other seven planets. It's very hard to explain those. Eight of the 91 moons rotate backwards. Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons orbiting in both directions. If the nebular hypothesis were true, all of these would be rotating the same direction. Not only that, there's another problem for them, which is just as large. It's that conservation of angular momentum. When an ice skater's twirling around and she moves her arms in, she starts to spin faster and faster. The things at the center of the nebulous, like the sun, would be spinning very fast. A lot of the momentum compared to the objects that are farther out, such as the planets, they should have a lot less of the momentum. This is the opposite of what we actually observe. In refuting evolution, Jonathan Sarfati says this, this angular momentum would have caused the sun to spin very rapidly. Actually, our sun spins very slowly, while the planets move very rapidly around the sun. In fact, although the sun has over 99% of the mass of the solar system, it only has 2% of the angular momentum. This pattern is directly opposite to the pattern predicted by the nebular hypothesis. This is a very, very hard thing for them to explain. A well-known solar system evolutionist scientist, Dr. Stuart Ross, said this, the ultimate origin of the solar system's angular momentum remains obscure. <laughs> The Big Bang and nebular hypothesis doesn't explain solar systems. 
The next piece of evidence that we have is spiral rate of galaxies, and this is a very, very hard one to refute. Basically, the inside of a galaxy spins slightly faster than the outside of the galaxy. So what you get are these sort of spiral arms, and a lot of times these are very, very beautiful. You can see them, they're really well defined there. And you can see probably two or three rotations. Well, if the universe was even 100 million years old, you should see a lot more than two or three rotations of the spiral arms. You should see possibly hundreds of rotations. So what you'd see is these legs going around and around and around and around, and it would have wrapped so many times around it that it should look like a flat disk, and they shouldn't even be definable, even if the universe was just 100 million years old, okay, much less 16 to 20 billion. So it should look like, kind of like a frisbee. Physicist and author James Treffel said this, the problem of explaining the existence of the galaxies has proven to be one of the thorniest in cosmology. Well, there's 60 billion of them. The Big Bang Theory should at least explain one of them, maybe. By all rights, they just shouldn't be there, yet there they sit. It's hard to convey the depth of frustration that this simple fact induces among scientists. Well, change your theory. Still, further problems. If the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed. Instead, it's lumpy. There are clusters of stars, then great voids. Because if you have an expanding ball of gas, you would expect the matter to be pretty evenly distributed, and it's not. The universe is pretty lumpy. Sir Fred Hoyle, astronomer and cosmologist, said this, I have little hesitation in saying that a sick paw now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. John Eddy said, this is a very interesting quote, he said, I suspect that the sun is 4.5 billion years old. However, given some new and unexpected results to the contrary and some time for some frantic recalculation and theoretical readjustments, I suspect that we could live with Bishop Usher's value of the age of the Earth and sun about 6,000 years. I don't think there's much in the way of observational evidence to conflict with that. Very fascinating quote. So they don't have a good explanation for where galaxies came from. What about star formation? And a star supposedly came from big balls of gas. Well, it actually talks quite a bit about stars. Why and when were stars created? Psalms 33.6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them. Does anyone know what the word universe means? Uni is... One verse is a spoken sentence. It stands for single spoken sentence. How did God create the world? He spoke it into existence. So even evolutionists who don't believe in God, who use the word universe, the history of the word has its roots in Christianity, has its roots in God speaking the world into existence. Uh, Psalms 148.5 says, For he commanded, and they were created. He spoke it into existence. Revelation 4.11 says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Then Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for the lights of the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. So the stars were created for signs and for seasons and to give light on the earth. It tells us explicitly that. There's an estimated 11 trillion stars for every person on the planet. That is a lot of stars. Psalms 147, 4 and 5 says, He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. It's interesting. You look at the size of the universe. You realize how big God is. He's enormous. And then you look at the cell and you realize all the minute details that God programmed into our bodies. And you realize how technical God is. And so you really get a, a good picture of who he is. This is interesting, though. He counts the number of the stars. That indicates that there's a finite number of them, doesn't it? He can count them. And he gives names to all of them. Plenty of stars explode. We haven't ever seen a star form. When they explode, they're called supernovas. It makes a big boom. There's actually a prediction made, according to the Big Bang model, as to how many first, second, and third stage supernovas there would be. First stage supernova is seven light years in diameter. A second stage is 300 light years in diameter. And a third stage is 1,500 light years in diameter. After they explode, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The universe is billions of years old. They predicted two first stage. 2,260 second stage, and 5,000 third stage supernova remnants. A 6,000-year-old Earth, the projected number would be two uh, first stage, 125 second stage, and zero third stage. The number is actually five first stage, 200 second stage, and how many third stage do you think there are? It's close to 5,000? Zero. So this is pretty powerful evidence that the universe is not as old as the evolutionary cosmologists say it is. Uh, it's interesting, this is by Danny Faulkner. We've never really seen a star form. Stars supposedly condense out of vast clouds of gas, and it has long been recognized that the clouds don't spontaneously collapse. 
and form stars. They need to be pushed somehow to be started. There have been a number of suggestions to get the process started, and almost all of them require having stars to start with. A shock wave from an exploding star causing compression of a nearby gas cloud. This is the old chicken of the egg problem, and it can't account for the origin of stars in the first place. So you've got this big ball of gas, which isn't collapsing in on itself. It's kind of spreading out and getting farther and farther apart. Well, if you have, and I read another article, if you have something like 20 stars that are around this big ball of gas, you have them all explode about the same time, it'll create pressure waves, and this ball of gas will, will condense in on itself and you get a star forming. Well, that doesn't get you very far, because where do those 20 stars that exploded come from? So this isn't a very good solution. So the Big Bang doesn't explain star formation very well. Abraham Loeb of Harvard Center for Astrophysics says this, the truth is that we don't understand star formation at a fundamental level. And it makes you wonder what they do understand. And if stars don't condense out of gas, planets certainly are not, because they have a lot less gravitational attraction. The Hubble Space Telescope, there's an interesting discovery that was made. It focused in on one spot in the sky about the size, if you hold a, a grain of sand at arm's length, it, it focused in on a spot in the sky that was supposed to be completely dark, completely black. The Hubble held its position for 10 days, focusing in on that one spot. And this is what it found. It found so many galaxies, you can't count them. What they were looking for is the edge of the universe, and they didn't find it. So it's fascinating. God, it's fascinating to me that God created things that we'll probably never see. <laughs> so let's go back to starlight. Is starlight a problem for creationists? You've got these stars that are billions of light years away. How did the light get here so quickly? Because we can obviously see them. There's three possibilities. The Earth is that old. I don't believe that's the case. I think there's a lot of other evidences that suggest that there's no way the Earth is that old. God created light in transit. I don't believe that. That was pretty popular among creationists a while back. And things don't appear as they seem. I, I think the third one is the case. There's some aspects of immature creation. That this is talking about God creating light in transit. That means that God created a light show, and, and from what we're seeing is light that he created and not necessarily the stars themselves. Continents with topsoil is part of a mature creation. Plants bearing seed is a mature creation. Fruit trees bearing fruit is a mature creation. Rocks with crystalline minerals, birds able to fly, are all part of a mature creation. God didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden as babies with, with a bag of seeds and say, have at it, good luck. He created them as grown-ups, and they were able to speak, able to talk with God, and that's all part of a mature creation. So it looks like they had a past history. It looks like they were... I don't know, 30, 40 years old, however old God created them, maybe 20 years old. We don't know, but they didn't. It was part of a mature, functional creation. I don't believe that light in transit necessarily fits that criteria. Was light part of mature creation? Now, there's no decisive biblical support for it, so I definitely don't think it should be held to dogmatically. Most of the events astronomers observe would never have happened. Those supernovas we just got through looking at Never, they may never have existed. It may just be a light show that God created. Number three, it discourages deeper investigation. People used to think that dinosaur bones were just there to test our faith. They thought they weren't actual animals. They were just put there by God to test us. And I think God creating light in transit, the idea is similar to that. Good observational science is being used to calculate the distance to stars. Some people think, well, maybe the stars aren't really as far away as we think they are. Maybe they're a lot closer in. No, I think the stars are billions of light years away. Okay, I think there's good evidence for that. So the question is still posed, how does the starlight get to the Earth in just 6,000 years if the distance to stars is extreme? There's different ideas, different cosmologies, and these are sort of outlined in Dismantling the Big Bang. This is a fantastic book if you're interested in this kind of stuff. CDA, the phenomenological model, and relativistic time dilation. I believe relativistic time dilation is the one we should go with. But remember, be dogmatic about Scripture. Don't be dogmatic about the scientific theories. C decay, this is the idea that speed of light in the past was much, much faster. And today, it's a lot slower. So because it was much, much faster in the past, the light had plenty of time to travel to the Earth. There are several problems with this. The speed of light change was heavily dependent on the earliest data. The most reliable measurements today show no change at all in the speed of light. A change in the speed of light changes the values of a lot of other physical constants. So you've got to fine-tune a bunch of other properties of matter so that life can continue to exist. There's other versions of CDK that predict blue shifts, which you do not observe. So no version of CDK theory can explain a young universe. And then the phenomenological model says that God basically created the stars billions of years ago so that the light would have time to travel to the Earth and so that we could see it. 
I don't believe this is a very good explanation either. It puts physical creation of the stars billions of years before creation week. You get the whole chronology out of whack. The refrain, and it was so, repeated six times in Genesis chapter 1, suggests that things happened in sequence. Exodus 20.11, Exodus 31.17, Hebrews 4.4 confirms the idea that all the work of creation was accomplished in six days, and Newton's physical interpretation of his model is also questionable. So I don't think that this idea explains it very well. I think relativistic time dilation, which was invented by Einstein, is a better explanation. There are two landmarks of creation science. The Genesis flood got creation science kicked off in the 1960s again. It basically launched the modern creation revival. And it was 1994 that Starlight and Time was published by Russell Humphreys. Up until 1994, we didn't have a self-consistent cosmological model, meaning the creationist cosmological model contradicted itself. But with Humphreys' model, he used Einstein's theory of relativity to base his model on. And we now have a self-consistent cosmological model that explains a lot of the things that we see. So this is very, very important. I would compare it to the Genesis flood as far as how important it is historically. Dr. Humphreys is a brilliant man. He was an award-winning physicist involved in physics research and development in geophysics, optics, nuclear physics, high-energy physics, electricity, magnetism, and theoretical physics. He did his PhD in physics from Louisiana State University. He has a dissertation on cosmic rays and ultra-high energy nucleon-nucleon interactions. Fascinating. And he's a former researcher at Sandia National Laboratories, and he retired from there, and he does research full-time for Institute for Creation Research. And that picture there, that's actually at the Creation Science Mega Conference. It's interesting, the man on the far left is Werner Gitt from... Germany, and then the, the man in the blue shirt in the middle is uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys. And it was really neat because Werner Gid is a scientist himself, but he was just all excited to meet Russell Humphreys. And he had him sign his book and got his autograph and everything. So there he is, excited to meet him. So it was a really neat time there. Your axioms, presuppositions, and bias play an important role in how you view the origins of the universe. If you take an unbounded cosmos, the universe is infinite. You put that in with the observations, which is the cosmos has expanded, and you turn that through general relativity, the differential equations, you're going to get Big Bang cosmology. It's a a natural fallout of their assumptions of an unbounded cosmos. If you have a bounded cosmos, which is a biblically-based assumption, remember God numbers the stars, and and he has named each one of them, so there's some specific size to the cosmos, and you take the fact that the cosmos has expanded, and you put that into general relativity, you get white hole cosmology. So uh, Russell Humphreys, in his book Starlight and Time, centered his idea around white hole cosmology, which is the opposite of a black hole. Basically, it spews out matter. So that was his idea. And we're, I'm not really going to go into it, but you're, I just th- I'm throwing this out here so that you'll be familiar with it, and if you want to read more about it, you're free to. Basically, the way we explain how distant starlight gets to the Earth is gravitational time dilation. And the rate of passage of time changes as you get closer and closer to a really strong gravitational field. And this was confirmed by atomic clocks. If you take an atomic clock at Boulder, Colorado, which is about a mile in altitude, and you take another atomic clock at Greenwich, England, which is about at sea level, over the period of a year, you get 0.00005 seconds difference. And you say, how's that going to help me get distant starlight to the Earth? (laughs) Well, if you had a lot stronger gravitational field, the effect would be a lot larger. So there's two things that basically change the rate of passage of time. When you have large velocities between two bodies, the rate of passage of time is different for them. And when you have a very high gravitational field, the rate of passage of time is different. And so this allows the possibility that time on Earth could have run at a much slower rate than time in the outer galaxies. And so what are we talking about here? Well, this is the quote from Dismantling the Big Bang. The vast size and a constant speed of light necessarily imply the appearance of a vast time scale. So the biblical cosmology does indeed imply a young Earth and an old universe. God created a universe that is billions of light years in size in only one Earth day. And so what we're talking about here is mass in the universe was closer together than at creation on day four when he created the the stars and the galaxies and everything. And if the Earth was close to the center of that mass, you'd have a huge gravity well. And therefore, the time on Earth would pass very, very slowly. The physical processes on Earth would pass very, very slowly compared to the physical processes at the outer edges of the galaxy. And then you have a bunch of allusions to God stretching out the heavens in Scripture. There's over 40 different allusions to it in the Old Testament. Isaiah 40 says this, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Who stretches out the heavens. Psalms 104.2, Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Zechariah 12, Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens 
Uh, Job 9, who alone stretches out the heavens. And then Job 26, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. So we see all these allusions to God stretching out the heavens. Russell Humphreys thought, well, at some point, God stretched out the heavens. <laughs> Maybe on day four. And so the heavens were stretched out. And all of a sudden, we get, a, we get the mass today that's so far apart that there's no gravity well. So across the universe today, we have about the same rate of passage of time. But on day four, it's apparent that we probably had the time on Earth going much, much slower. So billions of years of processes can occur on the outer edge of the galaxy than on the inside. A lot of people say, isn't this kind of giving in and saying that some parts of the universe are a lot older? Yeah, if you measure them by their own time scale, but if you measure it by Earth's standard time, those are only 6,000 years old. The physical processes in the outer edge happened a lot faster. Dr. Humphrey's white hole cosmology has a couple of problems. Unlike evolutionists, I will tell you, Everything warts and all. Okay, I don't hold uh, dogmatically to these theories. I happen to subscribe to them, though. Number one, it fails to account for the hundreds of thousands of years that have passed within our own galaxy and those nearby. And it predicts blue shifts in light from nearby galaxies, which are not observed. The model needs some modification, which Humphreys admits in his Starlight and Time. So there's different people, Hartnett and Alex Williams and some other uh, uh, Christian astronomers who are working on these theories. Hartnett's young solar system model is one of them. Day one, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens are comparable with the current size of our solar system. Day two, God separated the waters and placed the waters above near the outer limits of the solar system. Remember the waters above and the waters below? Now he's saying these waters and it could be outside our solar system. And then day four, he created the sun, moon, and stars and stretched out the heavens to make room for them all. And when he stretched out the heavens, you have the gravity well disappearing. So you get maximum time dilation in the center of solar system. Is this what actually happened? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know that this is absolutely what happened, but it's, it's an interesting idea, and I'm all for a, a Christian astronomer trying to base his evidence on Scripture. Let's talk about some other things. Did you know that short-period comets are constantly losing material and have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years? If the universe is billions of years old, how can we still have comets? They should have gone by the wayside a long time ago. Well, Evolutionists have invented something called the Oort cloud to explain where these come from. But this is something that no one's ever seen. It's just a figment of their imagination, as far as we know. The Earth's magnetic strength has declined 6% in the last 150 years. Why does the Earth still have a magnetic field if the Earth is 4.5 billion years old? The Earth's magnetic field protects us from solar radiation, and without it, radiation-induced diseases would increase. Romans 8, 21, and 22 says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain from the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The electromagnetic field decline is just the continuing of the entire creation uh, being in a bondage to decay and a groaning in the pains of childbirth. The universe is falling apart. The Earth's rotation is slowing down very slightly. If you're sitting at the equator, you're moving at 1,000 miles per hour compared to the, to the axis of the Earth. The revolution around the sun is 66,000 miles per hour, the solar system traveling around the galaxy is 500,000 miles per hour, and overall motion of the galaxy is 1.1 million miles per hour. So you're moving very, very quickly. So the next time you get pulled over for going slightly too fast on the highway, and he asks you how fast you think you were going, you say, well, I'm going 1.1 million miles per hour around the galaxy. I, I wouldn't encourage you to use that. I'm sure that wouldn't work. Astronomy Magazine says this, Earth's rotation is slowing down to compensate for lacking motion. June will be one second longer than normal. This leap second, announced by the International Earth Rotation Service, in February will keep calendar time in close alignment with international time. And so here's the years that they've added an extra second because the Earth's slowing down on its axis. Well, if you extrapolate this into the past, you get the Earth spinning much, much faster in the past. What you have is the Coriolis effect occurring, and you get really, really strong winds on Earth, and it would make life pretty much unlivable on land. And so now we know what happened to the dinosaurs. They got blown off the Earth. Saturn has rings, and these are a problem for old Earthers. Saturn's rings are unstable and cannot be billions of years old. At the present condition of its rings means they can't be more than 100 million years old. The moon, there's a lot of theories for how we got the moon. And if there's any planetary body that we should know anything about besides the Earth, it should be the moon. We don't know how the moon got there, or evolutionists don't know it. There's three basic theories that have been proposed. Fission theory, capture theory, and condensation theory. Fission theory says when the Earth was molten, it spun fast enough for a blob to come off, and then that started to rotate around, and it eventually became our moon. There's major problems with that theory. That's fallen by the wayside, and that was actually invented by Charles Darwin's son. The capture theory says that there's a planetary object that was coming close to the Earth, 
and it somehow got captured in Earth's orbit, that's not possible because you've got to have some way to slow down the planetary body. Okay? As it approaches the Earth, it's going to be moving faster and faster and faster. It'll be slingshotted off of the Earth. You can't get into orbit that way. If you've seen the Star Trek, and the Star Trek went around the sun and got slingshotted off so it could get extra speed to get back home. That was sort of the same principle. And then there's the condensation theory where they condensed out of the same cloud of gas. But because chemically the moon and the Earth are different, that's not a very good theory either. So currently they have a fourth theory, the giant impact hypothesis. And this says that one planetary body smashed against the Earth four and a half billion years ago, and somehow particles came off of that and eventually formed the moon. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Rezica says this, This hypothesis has risen not so much because of the merits of its theory as because of the apparent dynamical or geochemical shortcomings of other theories. Very true. The moon is moving farther away from the Earth at a very slow rate. If you extrapolate into the past, that means that the Earth at some point in the past was closer. Well, the gravitational attraction between two bodies follows basically an inverse square law. So if you move the moon to one-third the distance that it has, you basically have nine times the force of gravity between the two planetary bodies. And I think of what that would do to the tides. You have nine times the force of gravity acting on the tides. The tides would wash over land. This basically says that the, the Earth-Moon system can't be four and a half billion years old. It actually has to be less than 1.2 billion years old, which might explain what happened to the dinosaurs. They mooned to death. But Our Creative Moon is a great book. Don DeYoung is a great author and writer, and he also co-authored it with John Whitcomb. Mercury is also one of those things that uh, evolutionists find difficult to explain. It has a magnetic field, and it shouldn't. Mercury is so small that the general opinion is the planet, i.e. its core, should be frozen solid eons ago. When the core is frozen solid, you don't have a magnetic field. It does today have a magnetic field. Most astrophysicists today have admitted that Mercury's high density cannot be accommodated within slow, gradual development models. Mercury is a trap that has seduced evolutionists and has a fatal attraction for solar system modelers. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a trap. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And Mercury is one of the smallest planets in our solar system. Okay, last thing we're talking about is the anthropic principle. The universe and the properties of matter and our solar system were well designed specifically so that we could live on Earth. The properties of matter have been fine-tuned for life. The electromagnetic coupling constant binds electrons to protons and atoms. If it was smaller, fewer electrons could be held. If it was larger, electrons would be held too tightly to bond with other atoms. Ratio of electron to proton mass is fine-tuned. If it was larger or smaller, molecules could not form. Electromagnetic and gravitational forces are finely tuned, so the right kind of star can be stable. And then our sun is the right color. If it was or, or bluer, photosynthetic response would be weaker. The Earth's distance from the sun is crucial for a stable water cycle. Too far away, and most water would freeze. Too close, and most water would boil. All the other parameters of our solar system seem to indicate that God designed it. Earth's gravity, axial tilt, rotation period, magnetic field, crust thickness, all appear to be fine-tuned for life to exist on Earth. God created the world for people to live in. Isaiah 45, 18 says this, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the Earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And if you look at the other planetary bodies, uh, just within our own solar system, there's no way life can exist. You look at our moon, and it's several hundred degrees in the sun, and it's minus several hundred degrees in the shade. So it, our planet is completely unique. Romans 120 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, they are without excuse. It appears also that God has input the Trinity on the universe we live in. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The universe is made of space, time, and matter. And you need all three to exist simultaneously. They must all exist together. If you didn't have time, when would you put the matter? If you didn't have space, where would you put the matter? If you didn't have matter, what would you put in the space? So they all exist and were all created simultaneously. Okay. You get elements of this in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is time. God created the heavens, it's kind of like space, and the earth, it's kind of like matter. So it appears that there's, there's kind of a trinity imprint on the, just the way our universe works. And not only that, it seems like the universe is kind of a trinity of trinities. Time has three components, space has three components, and matter, in some respect, has three components. Time, past, present, and future, space, length, width, and height, matter, solid, liquid, or gas, or if you want to call it electron, proton, and neutron. So just some interesting things. You can make of it what you will. And not only that, but it seems almost like the Trinity has been imprint on us. 
Man is mind, body, and spirit. And so we have three components to ourselves as well. Using apologetics material, there's a correct way to use it and there's an incorrect way to use it. And the correct way, legit uses for creation science material and any apologetics material, is to strengthen your faith, to strengthen other people's faith, and to restore confidence in God's word or to witness to others. Those are legitimate uses for it. Illegitimate uses, to make yourself look good, draw attention to yourself, become a know-it-all. No one likes a know-it-all. So don't do that. And when witnessing to other people, when using this material, it's not about winning an argument. It's about winning people over for Christ. And you've got to remember that. It doesn't matter how right you are. If you're not a nice person and people don't like you, you're going to be dragging the name of Christ through the mud. So don't do that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is the famous love chapter. And it says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So take this to heart. We need to treat people with love. We need to treat people with respect. And we need to genuinely care about the people that we're trying to use this information to witness to. And this understand all mysteries and all knowledge. We've been talking about a lot of mysteries and a lot of knowledge here. We need to couple that with love in order to bear fruit for God. When witnessing, remember love. Remember the characteristics of love. And remember what love is and what it isn't. And both are given in Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. So when you're talking to someone, be patient with them. Be kind to them. <laughs> okay, remember that first off. And when they are talking to you, listen to them and try to answer their questions. It's not just about you beating them over the head with all the evidence that you have. It's about you listening to them, figuring out what they're having problems with, and answer their specific problems. And then remember not to envy or boast, be arrogant, rude, irritable, or re resentful. Okay. And you may say, well, you don't know what kind of week I've had, and no, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but my cross-country coach used to say the best time to practice good form is at the end of the workout. And that's the time when you're usually going to slack off and, and lose your good form. Whether you're having a good week or not, we need to be godly and we need to love everyone. Last up, there's a lot of arguments that Christians should not use, and this is one that you should not use as well. It depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. Darwin recanted on his deathbed. There's no evidence that this is true. There's nothing written down or no, obviously no videotapes or recordings of him doing this. Moon dust proves a young moon. This was a popular argument 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's not so popular today because the rate of accumulation of moon dust varies so widely. NASA found a missing day in 40 minutes proving Joshua's long day. This email goes around every few years. I'm sure some people have gotten it. There's no evidence that this is true at all. Woolly mammoths were snapped frozen during the flood catastrophe. Woolly mammoths lived during the Ice Age, which occurred several hundred years after the flood. God didn't say he was going to freeze the animals to death. He said he was going to flood them to death. So I don't believe that. The Japanese trawler Zui Maru caught a dead plesiosaur near New Zealand. Unfortunately, I love the pictures they've got of this dead plesiosaur. Unfortunately, this is in contention because some people believe that it's a basking shark. And I'm not convinced either way. I, we, unfortunately, we do not have the actual dead body here to confirm it either way. Beyond that, there are so many good evidences that are not being contested. You might as well use those, right? Second law of thermodynamics began at the fall. This is not true at all. The, the second law of thermodynamics, if it wasn't in effect when God created the world, then friction wouldn't exist. You wouldn't be able to walk. When you ate your food, you wouldn't be able to digest it because it wouldn't break down in your stomach. So the second law of their dynamics was there at creation. And women have one more rib than men. Not true. There are no beneficial mutations. Here again, the idea isn't, is it beneficial? The idea is, has there been any new information that's being added to the system? Because you need new information to go from a protozoa to a pony. So it's not of whether it's beneficial or not. That, that doesn't matter. Pluxy tracks prove that humans and dinosaurs coexist. These are in contention. There are so many good evidences that are not in contention. Don't use them. Ron Wyatt has found Noah's Ark. Anything with Ron Wyatt's name, a red flag should go up. Ron Wyatt has produced a lot of things that are just fallacious. And he, he made a lot of claims. Unfortunately, he didn't back them up very well. He's not a real guy to, guy to go to for apologetics evidences. There was no rain before the flood. There's evidence in Scripture of a different hydrologic cycle, but it doesn't say there's no rain before the flood, so we shouldn't be dogmatic about that. Natural selection is a tautology. Natural selection happens. Natural selection is how we get zebras and donkeys and horses. Evolution is just a theory. Usually what people mean is that evolution isn't, isn't an actual fact. 
so it shouldn't be taught dogmatically. Okay. And so you need to just say that. Hey, saying it's just a theory, it is just a theory. <laughs> so what? That doesn't really prove anything. You need to say it's, un, it's not proven, so it shouldn't be taught dogmatically. Gold chains have been found in coal. Unfortunately, we don't usually have the actual coal that it came out of. I could say this water bottle came from coal. You couldn't prove me wrong. I mean, it doesn't really... I happen to believe that they found a lot of stuff in coal. But unfortunately, if you don't have the coal that it actually fell out of, and the coal crumbles because it's pretty brittle, then you don't have much proof there. There's a lot of places to go to to get apologetics and creation science stuff. I would encourage you to go to answersingenesis.org. It's a great place to go to. Creation on the web, I use this all the time. Creation on the web is the place I usually go to. They put out a lot of material. They have a lot of scientists behind them. And Institute for Creation Research is another good organization you can go to to get information on creation science stuff. This concludes the last lecture. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. This has been a fantastic class.